Welcome everybody to TLP Pathways. This is our fourth webinar of our 2019-2020 webinar series. This afternoon we'll be discussing uh, proficiency-based learning. My name is Kevin Peely Hunt. I'm a fifth through eighth grade generalist on Swift House at Wilson Central School. And we're joined by our usual group of contributors who will introduce themselves shortly. Um, first, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Middle Grades Collaborative and the Tarrant Institute for Innovative Education for all their support. Hi, I'm Lindsay Hallman, and I work for Up for Learning. Hi, I'm Maura Wheeler. I'm the Proficiency-Based Learning and Technology Integration Coach at Lamoille South um, Unified Union. And um, today we're really focusing on proficiency-based learning, and I was really reminded, um, and I wrote a little bit in the blog post, but I'm seeing so many things, you know, the decade challenge and everyone's Spotify playlist year in review. And with the calendar changing this year to 2020, which was our, you know, timeline for having graduates graduating in a proficiency-based learning system, how we're at this really um, opportune time to really stop and evaluate, stop and, and reflect on the systems that we're putting in place uh, specific to proficiency-based learning. So. Um, today, we're really going to be thinking about assessment, um, how we're partnering with students in the classroom, and reflecting on um, the design of our learning targets and tasks and systems um, across our schools. I'd like to start um, with a quote by Helen Beatty, um, who also works at Up for Learning. Um, and Helen said, in a proficiency system, there's time for practice and learning from mistakes. Redoing work to reach mastery follows the natural learning progression. It also encourages learners to take risks as they master new skills and concepts. In this system, a student's capacity as a learner is continually reinforced. Educators better understand their students and allow students better understand themselves as learners. Proficiency-based learning allows educators and the learners to identify their strengths and weaknesses to monitor learning progress over time. And I, I picked that quote um, specifically um, about the idea of a student's capacity as a learner being continually reinforced. And so as we think about proficiency-based learning today, I think, um, you know, really thinking about who are those learners in our classrooms and how is proficiency-based learning either working um, for all of our students and then where are some of the gaps that we maybe um, are still experiencing. Um, I think being at the place that we are, um, I know schools are all in different places of implementation, but it's so important to remind ourselves of the why behind the shift. So why in 2013 with Act 77, why was this something that um, schools really committed themselves to? Um, and there's two sort of resources that I go to frequently for um, my why that I actually keep really close on hand. Um, and the first one is the Great Schools Partnerships Beliefs and Practices um, in Proficiency-Based Learning. And I just wanted to sort of share the four beliefs and maybe have a conversation about them because I think um, so much about this shift is really about shifting um, sort of what we as schools um, value and believe in and becoming more explicit about, about those things. And so there are four beliefs. The first one, uh, belief number one, all students can and will learn when they feel included, respected, and valued by their learning community. Belief number two is students are known as individuals and learners, and they are supported in developing positive relationships with each other and with adults in the learning community. Belief number three, student learning is enhanced by clear cycles of practice, feedback, assessment, and reflection. And belief number four, students are empowered and engaged by choice in their learning experience. And so um, Great Schools Partnership has put out these four beliefs to being key, um, sort of the key why in a proficiency-based learning system. So I just wanted to sort of um, put those out there um, and have a little bit of a conversation about how that connects with um, sort of what we're seeing in our schools or in our conversations about proficiency-based learning. Um, does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah. yeah I, so I really appreciate 
that um, we started with the, the four belief statements because um, I think that to really be grounding everyone in, in, um, in thinking about what is, what is a proficiency system and why, and, and just like you said, the why. But um, I think what I have observed or noticed or sense is that oftentimes in schools, there's, there, can, there can be at times a deficit mindset and, and on the part of both educators and learners about what students or what learners can and cannot do. And I think that it starts with that change of the mindset. So it's a paradigm shift, what we believe about young people and their potential. And then, so I like that it starts with that, like you need to change your mindset. Mm -hmm. And then you really need to understand that it's all about relationships, that you have to get to know one another deeply and be in positive relationship with one another in order to support each other's growth. And that with that relationship comes that cycle of learning and that it's not a one and done thing. It's that there's constant feedback and practice and reflection and from there, the ultimate goal would be what at our organization we consider like the fruit of, you know, um, fruit of the tree, which is empowered and engaged young people who want to make, who care about their learning, who want to make change in their community. So those really resonated with me, but I think that it's the hardest part, but the most important part is number one, which is changing our mindset about what what young people can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay, I love that you brought that up too, because when I'm looking at, you know, belief one, as you were talking about it, you know, for a student to feel included, respected, and valued, you know, like you said, it, it comes back to those relationships with students. And I think that's such an important thing for us to remember is everything that we're doing is it starts with the relationships and building the relationships with kids. It doesn't start with, you know, a KUD or, or your standards or your unit design. It's, you have to be able to have that trust first and, and have that level of mutual respect with, with your kids before any of this other stuff can even happen. So I, I just love that one. That's the first belief on here. And then just what you were saying about it, I completely agree with it. And then uh, a couple of things that stood out with me too. Um, I mean, obviously pieces of every single one. And I just liked how belief three, um, the student learning is enhanced that clear cycles of practice, feedback, assessment, and reflection. I just like how it didn't, it, those things all feel like they have equal weight. It's not, it's enhanced by assessment. And in order to do this, you have to do these other things. It's, it's you know, for, for this system to really work, you have to have every one of those components working and valued the same, where students and teachers are valuing the practice that they're putting into the skills and, and are, you know, again, getting regular feedback, are having the ability to, to be assessed. And, and most importantly, I think a lot of teachers don't get to this point, but are, I think, growing with this whole process are the reflection pieces, having students reflect on their growth as learners. So they're starting to identify their own growth and recognize and be able to advocate for things that they need to be successful. Yeah, and I was just thinking that you could like um, take, you know, take those belief statements and insert a number of things. Personalized learning, why? Mm -hmm you know, what do you need in order to have that? You know, so it's all about a student-centered learning environment. And, um, and those beliefs should be the fabric of our schools, you know? And, and then I think that everything else then aligns and makes sense. And so that it doesn't feel like, oh, this is another add-on or initiative, this proficiency-based learning or assessment. It's because of this why, you know, and these beliefs, so. And I, when I think, I think about the conversations that we have across the year, you know, and if you really are listening for it, I feel like in every episode, no matter what the topic, we always come back to relationships with students and amplifying student voice. And, and so what I also appreciate about um, the belief statements um, is that it really mirrors a lot of the other things that we know are, are what students need to be successful. Um, and um, they really are um, transferable, if you will, into the other, some of the other aspects 
um, of what we know about young adolescents. Um, Yeah, I was, does anyone have anything else about the um, four beliefs or have people used them in the past or seen them? I feel like uh, I've seen them, but I, yeah. now that like we're talking about them, like, like you were saying, I feel like this should be at the foundation of pretty much everything that we're doing. Like, I don't know why this doesn't come up regularly in like our faculty meetings and, and work that we're doing with our colleagues and, and, and being transparent with kids too like hey this is these are what our values and what our you know four beliefs about this process and I think yeah, I'm like this is a hey we should be doing more of this and having this be out in the forefront yeah imagine if you started every staff meeting with like let's just sit for a moment and read these aloud you know <laughs> and like and then now we can talk about the whatever their learning targets that we need to you know you know, edit or whatever it is, so that that is the mindset set that you enter into all those, you know, the the nitty gritty with, because that really is the core to everything. I, I don't think like, I've seen these, but I don't think that they're anything like that any educator would be like, shocking, you know, I mean, I think it's why we all deeply want to be educators and deeply believe in, um, in education and that's the the path that we've chosen so that a lot of those other pieces kind of you know pull us away from this central heart of of the why and um so wouldn't that be wonderful if like every staff meeting or if it was posted you know like those should be the belief statements that are posted in every school mm -hmm. so to continue our conversation um <laughs> Today, we and to guide some of our reflection, I wanted to sort of anchor it in our focus on equity this year. Um, and in thinking about um, the systems that we're creating, so as we're sort of changing and transforming our schools and creating new systems, um, and thinking about the equity literacy framework um, from Paul Gorski, there's sort of two areas where I feel like these really um, touch. The first is recognizing. So having curiosity about the policies um, that were these new policies that we're putting in place um, and how they might disadvantage some students either intentionally or unintentionally. So, you know, this is a time to really be looking and watching. We're trying to put in new systems in place and this is a time where we can also pivot and adjust and um, since we are still in the new, this new process. And then the next is really about creating and sustaining. So what do bias-free and equitable classrooms, schools and institution cultures look like? Um, specifically in my mind around um, having high expectations and having all students having access to higher order pedagogy. So are all students being given opportunities? When we think about a learning scale, like are all students being given these complex tasks and problem solving, um, and which I think is really important in creating sustain and sustaining bias-free classrooms. And then the other one is um, really prioritizing the consideration and needs, challenges, and barriers experienced by students or from marginalized groups, um, sort of in each decision about the classroom, school, or district. So as we are making these new decisions, how are we prioritizing um, marginalized um, groups in those discussions? And so, yeah, did you want yeah, to say I was had a thought. Um, I was just thinking that with the first one, with recognize, like who benefits from a, a proficiency-based learning system and who does not? Mm -hmm. And maybe for the first time, we can flip it and say those that do not benefit are those that have had the privilege and power and capital to benefit from a system that truly... Um, marginalized others you know and and that would be our a traditional system where it's you know you know where we're looking at uh a b c and d and not having anything to back that up with you know or so i i just kind of had that aha moment as you're going through that like maybe we're flipping it for flipping it a little bit if we can really um look at this 
uh, as an equitable practice and integrated into our schools and uh, with fidelity, then maybe we're flipping it that those that traditionally did not benefit from the school system have access to opportunities to be successful. I don't know. What do you all think? I, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. It, it, it's, it is definitely an aha moment of thinking about the process and, and that switch. Um, it, I also like, it makes me think too, and, and we've been having this conversation just about making sure we're addressing all of our learners. And, and I feel like a lot of districts, we do a great job with, with kind of tier two and, and tier three interventions and differentiation. And then, um, you know, looking at like a learning scale, we, the last thing we, not last thing, but, but we don't do as much work around the fours on that scale and, and making sure, like you said, like those kids, who maybe you just got an A and, and that was, you know, that's what you did. But now it's like, you know, how are we addressing that and making sure that, that we're addressing the needs of all of our learners and hitting them, mm -hmm. and, uh, getting them at, you know, their, their level where, you know, that talking about like their ZPD and then making sure that we're providing rigorous tasks for everybody at this space and the, and the pace that they need. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's a really interesting conversation to think about that flip. Yeah, I was also thinking like, how do we create this proficiency based system that doesn't have like um, shame, shaming and um, like, um, with, like uh, baked into it, you know, so like that it's okay to be at the beginning stage. Mm -hmm because we all are beginning at some point. <laughs> but like, are the proficiencies written and designed to automatically shame those that are not, you know, starting at a three? Mm -hmm. And are they providing opportunities for everyone to grow? You know, so that those that are maybe starting at, at the beginning stages of a scale or proficiency don't see that as, shameful or um a negative piece that it's an area to start and that it's, it's you know it's a journey along the way so another thought that really that connects back for me to um helen's quote like what does a school look like where a student's capacity as a learner is continually reinforced mm. and and when we say student we mean all students like where every student in our buildings, not even buildings, right? Like schools are beyond buildings, but what would that look like? Um, and, and how do we get there? Right, because it's really easy to uh, just um, take the, the proficiency-based system and just lay it over the traditional system. Mm -hmm. And here we have it. And I think that's been the case in many places because there hasn't been this kind of conversations. Like there needs to be this level of community dialogue around the why. And, and, and so that it's not a, not a system that you can just overlay and here it is mm -hmm. on top of the, of the system that hasn't been working for many people for so long. Um, and so I'm not sure where my thought was going. <laughs> right, that it, you really have, it's again, goes back to my initial thought around like, it's a complete mindset change about like, when I walk into this building, it's not like these are the, this type of person and this is this type of person, the smart kid, the this kid. It's that everyone has um, the ability to enter into this work and that everyone has the capacity to be successful. And, it's, um, and so I think proficiency-based learning is just one piece of all the different structures that are currently in schools that need to be dismantled, right? In order to really ensure that this is not just putting it on top of the traditional system. And here we have something that looks a little bit shinier and newer. And that uh, honestly dovetails really nicely with our, our next section here that, um, you know, more, more developed some of these questions from Ina Call. And one of the first ones is talking about, it says, in what ways does the school culture promote a growth mindset, build trust and in inclusivity? So it's, and thinking about what you're just saying, Lindsay, about, you know, it's a, it's a mindset shift. And, and, you know, one thing when this was rolled out in our district, um, we had, again, Stan and Emily were the ones that were our instructional coaches, and they have the book, uh, Standards-Based Classroom, for any, those interested in, in reading up on that. But their first piece that we were introduced to is, you know, this is really about, 
you know, the difference between communication versus compensation. Mm -hmm. And that we always just want to be communicating with the students where they are in their learning journey. And they kept referring to that as their learning journey. And, you know, they, they uh, used the metaphor of the blue dot on a GPS and how, you know, here's your destination. And, and that blue dot is just constantly sending you back that signal of here's where you are on your way to your destination. You might be taking a different route than somebody else, but that's constantly telling you, like, here's where you are on, on your way there. Um, and that's kind of what our role is as, as mm -hmm. facilitators, constantly giving that feedback and just letting our students have the opportunity to see where they are along this journey to, you know, to the target and be able to provide them feedback along the way of what they need next and to have them reflect on what, you know, they're doing well, what they're struggling with and be able to recognize in their own learning, the things that they need. So I, I again, that like, how are we as schools promoting that? And to your point too, Lindsay, about what you're talking about, um, like are our scales and targets written in a way mm -hmm. where everybody feels like they have success? I know we've spent countless hours in meetings with our PLCs talking about the language of our scales because that nowhere on our scale do we ever have like didn't do this or didn't have the requirement right. or only had two instead of three. Like every single you know, one, two, three, and four starts with I can and it's what can the student do at that level? Like there's never a single negative thing. And I think that that just really changes, again, the culture around it and, and the mindset of, well, what are we trying to do with these? And it's really communicate the, the learning. So I thought that worked nicely with that. Yeah, and I, I really like um, the idea of like, what are we doing here? Is, are these, is, this a, is this for communication or compensation? Mm -hmm. Is for compensation, then we haven't changed our practice, we haven't changed our schools, and we're truly just perpetuating a system that does not work for many people. But if this is truly a communication tool, and that's what they are, especially when they're written in I can statements, which I really, um, that really resonates with me as well, then, you know, it's a, it's a place for us to say, okay, here I am now. What, what's my next moves? What's my playlist here? Like, how am I going to get from here to here? What support do I need? What are my goals? So it ties into the goal setting piece. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's an, I think it's a lot as an educator to think about, well, how my teach, like, what is my classroom going to look like, you know, and how, how does that change what things look like and how, um, so yeah, no, I, I, I love that idea of communication versus compensation, mm -hmm. compensation being the old system mm -hmm. and communication being what it should be and and the, and also the fact that their book is called standards base like this proficiency base has not is not like a new thing as of 2013 like mm -hmm. there have been many people who have been using a standard standards base learning a standards based <laughs> communication process for many many years mm -hmm. and you know and 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 it's we we are lucky as a state to have a state that says, this is what we value. Mm -hmm. So. And it, and to that point too, I think with, you know, coming from the state's perspective with Act 77 and Flexible Pathways, like this just opens the door too for, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if we're developing these scales in this way and, and really thinking about those I can statements, then, you know, that opens the door for educators to not feel like they're pigeonholed and I have to teach this content this way but I can offer, you know, my students with a variety of means that are personalized to what they need to be able to address this skill. And, and again, just that constant communication about that is huge. Um, but yeah, that just, the first time I heard that communication versus compensation, I'm like, that just, that makes so much sense. And, so much and, it, sense. and it's good too, because you just, especially I remember when I was first in the classroom, like catching yourself, like, am I doing this? And, or, or am I holding this as a carrot above the students? Like, right. oh, you need to do this in the three, or am I giving them the scale to communicate with them what, where they're at? And, and it's, it's been a big shift too, I think with the parents, I think that's a bigger discussion. It might be great to hear from, from both of you about, but just, um, I think that's a big adjustment for the parents too, when we were reporting out on certain things and they had regular access, you know, sometimes depending on what we were doing in class, the kids might only be at a one or two because that's just what we've addressed for that skill at that time. Like they couldn't even have an opportunity yet to get to the three. And it was alarming for parents to be like, why does my kid only have a one? But it's like, no, I'm just, that's all we're, we're doing right now. Like we've only addressed the one that's, 
all the, you know, we haven't had an opportunity to even show what you could do at the three just because we're sitting at that one and two level. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big shift, but I think, again, if, if we're giving regular feedback and communicating mm -hmm. well with the students and, and communicating that with the families too, so it's clear that this is a, a, a learning progress and learning journey, um, that's definitely helped ease some of those tensions uh, at home in terms of what does this look like for the parents getting this new information. Yeah, uh, another thing you just said really uh, resonates around like how we report, like the reporting system becomes again a form of compensation if we send out these quarterly or um, trimester report cards, which is, which again is like a form of compensation. Like, are you, it's like your evaluation at a, you know, um, and if we're in a proficiency based system, that's not that's not accurate data. That's like one snapshot in time, but it does not demonstrate anything about, you know, the goal, the, the journey along the way, you know, so having systems in place where there's access, you know, to information around growth and learning and it's readily available and accessible to families, which I'm not sure for, you know, if that's, you know, really there yet, but it sounds like those are conversations, Kevin, that you've been having with your families. And I like the idea of like, the fact that like, we're starting here at a one, like this is where we're starting. And, you know, we're going to be moving along the scale to get ourselves to, to be able to meet this proficiency and, and, and beyond. If, and so being able to communicate that, I think that's, maybe the most important piece because it's really a community the community piece of just feeling uncertain and unsure of what this really means right and just that conversation sorry more like formative and versus summative and and how you know, we just never report on formatives because it's practice it's a kid's opportunity to be messy and make mistakes and be fine with that because it should be messy and you should, should be making mistakes and playing with the, these ideas so like that's a big that again was an adjustment I think for a lot of teachers in our district was you know where they're used to having this grade book that you know they're reporting out almost every that our parents could access online and they're seeing like what my kid do in class today why'd they get an 87 on this one task that you did versus like we're just not reporting on those formatives as as like the the thing that you're seeing like we're reporting right. on the formatives once once they get to a point where they're going to show us what they can do independently but that formative stuff is all well, just that you know we're, we're in the muck with the feedback and trying new things and adjusting as we go so that's that was that's been a big shift that I think has been really positive. I think that connects back um, for me about with um, at the beginning we talked talk a little bit about what it would look like like where a student could be at a one and be at the beginning phases of learning and not experience shame um, and where it connects for me is that when it's communication and not compensation, we get to talk about the process of learning and we get to talk about it in different ways um, without then compensating, right? And so it does allow opportunities in thinking about sort of establishing school cultures anchored in um, learners' capacity or growth mindset to really, um, to really communicate in a way that shows the value of the, what learning looks like um, and that it's not this linear progression and that, you know, it's okay to stumble at the beginning. And so, um, you know, I think all those pieces really connect there. And this is a thing you think of a conversation we were having um, before we, we started the webinar of, of kind of in terms of equity, not only with our students, but across the, our districts and the state. And, you know, how are, what can we be doing, you know, as a state to do a better job of making sure that looking at, you know, from one district to the next, some of these pieces are starting to align a little bit. So we're providing our kids with equitable access to this type of learning and, and this type of idea of like, again, communication versus compensation. I think that's, I think that's going to be <laughs> forever growing and changing, obviously, because you can't just change you know, every district at once, but um, I think it's a bigger conversation to have because, and even I think within our different schools that we represent here, there's probably pretty yeah. vast differences. You know, there's a ton of similarities, but just in our reporting system and the way that 
um, teachers are trained on, on this information, on the access teachers have, just of, of being able to go to conferences and learn more about this. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's a bigger issue that um, definitely needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah I mean, I wonder like, um, <coughs> that, that on that same thread, is it truly equitable if like, there's a group of adults that continue to write and rewrite um, these learning targets in a little bubble without asking um, the people that are supposed to be demonstrating their learning on those targets, if these are truly A, worded in a way that are accessible and understandable and, and B, are these, the, are, we, are we hitting the mark here? Are we missing the mark, you know? And so where are our young people in designing these targets, mm -hmm. you know, and being able to take the proficiencies and then supporting the work around designing targets because I think there's a lot of time spent designing learning targets and maybe more you can talk more about that um, designing the learning targets and communicating them to the, the adults but um, and redesigning and redesigning and trying to get it right and language right but like what about if we just you know brought in the people that are the ones that are supposed to be demonstrating it our young people yeah, I think that's really helpful. And one of the things that we talk a lot about, we have sort of our bigger grain size mastery scales. Um, and those are really like task neutral, really about the skill progression. Um, and then our teachers rework them um, into sort of their classroom level scales. And that's where I really see, and they're so conscious about, you know, we call it student friendly language, but, but really about getting feedback from their students and adjusting and making sure that there's clarify, they're clarifying it. But then also thinking about at what point do you pause and say, does this make sense to you? What I'm asking you to do, because really what we're trying to do is, you know, I think back to what Kevin was saying about the GPS, you know what the destination is on your GPS. You get three routes, you know, where there's a little traffic. Um, and if you don't know where your end destination is, how do you know what routes are possible? And so at what point are we pausing with students and saying, does this make sense? Do you understand what it is that, that we're working towards? Um, because I think that transparency also allows access to that higher order thinking. Like if we know where we're going, all students get, um, you know, one, the opportunity to say, and and share their voice in in the process of defining what the learning looks like um, but then also in being able to um, sort of know what the paths are um, mm -hmm. when it's presented in a way that is transparent where we're going um, yeah what if like when a le a unit or a lesson or um, was introduced the learning target was the first, like the first piece that was dissected and, you know, really like, this is what's here. Mm -hmm. What, let's, um, let's like unpack each of these words and what, what is the action that needs to happen? You know, like what's the active piece? What are the, you know, like, does this make sense? Where are we as a group around mm -hmm. this? Where are we as individuals around this? what are the like if you took a learning target and use the beginning of your unit or however you know whatever mm -hmm. to take time to really unpack that and say like what do we need to get here right. as a group and as an individual and also like what about this makes sense and what about this doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and use that as a learning tool i mean think about all the proficiencies that goes into just that like dissecting and and and, and understanding a learning target and, and making that an experience. So like, here's what we're supposed to be, this is what we're doing. Let's talk about this mm -hmm. and let's really look at it closely. Let's share out what our understanding is and then let's let's message it for ourselves too so that we can speak to it. Yeah. So what does this mean for you? What does this mean for me? And, and then start using that language of learning. I would say that's one thing that we've been encouraged to do for a while is like on the top of anything we're doing with kids, like have that learning skill present. And, and they're saying like at the beginning of units, like start with what you're saying let's feel let's see what one feels like a two feels like a three feels like and a four feels like give the kids at those levels as a group 
you know, with, with all the accommodations and everything present there. So then when, by the time they're trying to be summatively assessed to it, to what they can do independently, they, they now already experienced what work goes into that or, or what the skills are for that. And um, one thing that we just started doing, which I'm really grateful for, um, for years, we've done what's called a math studio. And it was, we do some research around, you know, best practices. And um, we would basically take a full day with the math teachers we, we'd look at some research and then we'd go watch, we'd observe one of the math teachers teach with a specific lens. We had like 10 teachers in the classroom watching this. We debrief after and then we talk about like our next steps. And what they're starting to do now um, is for part of our faculty meetings with our different PLCs, like for our humanities teachers, especially in science, is we're able to go observe a classroom who Stan and Emily come in and help prep the classroom to, to really do this work of let's get into the scales and, and develop these really, you know, intrinsic lessons where kids are practicing these skills. And then the teachers are seeing it in action, being able to ask kids after the fact, like what it was like, be brief with them. And that's just been such a powerful learning for us to be able to, to see, because again, a lot of this is great theory and you hear it, but to have the opportunity to say, all right, what does that look like for me to do in a classroom? Like, how do I start? So I, I feel like that would be a great thing for, you know, administrators to start thinking about is how are we providing teachers access to knowing like here's how we start like it's one thing to spend time to write the scales and know well, for us to know what the scales are but we also need to give teachers time to mm -hmm. be able to practice and say okay you know what's your lesson going to look like how are we going to be giving feedback to all these people <coughs> going to be checking in as a group so yeah it's definitely been a powerful learning uh, in that regard for us so with that Lindsay I know we're, we're kind of short on time but yeah, um, can I get into the practice here? Yeah, I want to space a little bit about the practice and then uh, yeah. at the time we'll, we'll talk about some of these questions. So, I mean, um, I think I'm going to be like interviewing you, basically. Yeah. But, and, and Laura and I can fill in our own, you know, experiences. But, um, <laughs> so I would love to hear about like when you're at the edge, like what that looked like and, and more. Sure. Like, so good. the first one is like, so right, we just did a lot of theory and a lot of theoretical and a lot of like, meta and deep thinking here although i i feel like like if i were in the classroom tomorrow i would take a learning target and like do exactly what i just feel like why didn't i do that all the time you know and that's probably fairly easy to do an activity a number of activities around a learning target spend a day doing that before you start diving in but what does it look like right now in your classroom i know you've shared some examples uh, but what else? Like, what does it look like for your students on yeah, a day-to-day? So -day? And again, I think a big piece of that is, is just from our district expectations too, which is nice, but, but they definitely are exposed to these learning scales on a regular basis. Um, one thing that has been really helpful that we've done as a team regularly, you know, before the, the district went to learning scales, that we were standards-based, and we'd always, at the end of every unit, have the kids go back into the scale and reflect on where they thought they were and write a little comment like a commentary on it. And that's that process and, and giving them time for that. I feel like time in and time out is so valuable and so important because, you know, we're, we're in it and, and doing these activities and, and prepping so we can definitely do these, you know, mixed groupings and, and making sure that kids going into each lesson are presented with a task that's going to help them get, maybe they're going from a one to a two or a two to a three or a three to a four. And that's a lot of prep. And, and working, but it's less grading or assessing, you know, it, it's more just, all right, here's my, here's the feedback I got in class. Here are my, my groupings for the next day. Here's my plan for moving this group to the next level and this group to the next level. So that's one thing that's changed is the, the like lesson planning and prep has gone up a little bit, but like the scoring anything has gone down. Yeah. You know, so that's, which is great. Um, like you're not taking home a bag of papers, you know, exactly. or like, right. It's exactly. like, that, it's just, and that's the exciting stuff. I feel like, how am I, what am I going to do with these kids tomorrow? They're like, really exactly. It's the design. It's the craft. It's the art of teaching. Yeah. And then going back to that, what I was saying with the reflection is that, that for us is like, that's how we, you know, see how did we do with that process and give the kids a chance to really speak to it. Um, but, you know, and it's, it's definitely not perfect. And it's, it's always messy. And some days I definitely leak and I'm like, whoa, that, like I did not do a good job with this and, and you feel, you know, and you have to just be really reflective and honest with yourself and saying, you know, I didn't do a good job addressing 
those kids who are at the two are, are at this one skill and moving them forward like they either I wasn't clear on my communication or they just didn't get it and I need to be able to create different level tasks but what's great is you know even with our reflection it always comes back to the student and what they need and and again thinking about how are we best communicating to them here's where you are right now on your journey and I I always remind myself of that every day like, how am I just communicating with this kid where if a random adult came in and said hey like where are you at right now they'll be able to say well like I want to be here right now I'm working on this and and be yeah. able to really get to that I think would is is our goal I think as, as educators yeah I think like what you just um shared is is huge that it should provide educators that space mm -hmm. to really um do the things that we are trained and skilled doing which is facilitating learning you know and not dragging home a pile of papers to look through or go through you know google docs or math papers you know so like when you know at, at there are times where assessment occurs but what you have described is the the journey that it's really more about thinking really creatively about how you can move each individual along mm -hmm. and um and differentiate and it requires creative thinking so when you have that time and space to be reflective and not be like you know have to go home and respond to 95 google docs mm -hmm. then you can truly be you know uh be engaged in your craft in the way that we should be and i think um for me that felt really freeing because that was kind of the way that we that we operated at the edge and um was that it was just gave me an opportunity to just like think whether it was on the drive home or when i was you know getting ready for the next day or driving to school just like thinking about individual youth and how i was going to support them you know and mm -hmm. instead of just like oh i didn't do this or i didn't do that you know and it's feeling so and putting purpose. like right yeah and what was what for both with both your experiences because one thing i come back to is it definitely takes time to to give uh you know genuine feedback that's going to help mm -hmm. kids and, and at times i'm like you know sometimes i feel like they do need that independent individual feedback which is again when you look at our whole day with that many kids, that many different levels, like that's, we, we don't have time. So no. it's like, what kind of strategies did you ever use in terms of, did you like group kids or, or like, how would you provide feedback either on the fly or, or like responding to Google Docs or if you do use other tools, um, like what was helpful when you were in the classrooms or what are you seeing now with other educators that, that they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I always found that the Monday memo and the Friday reflection was a great way to to provide individual feedback and also keep that communication really open and um, dynamic with the families. Um, I'm thinking about something like, you know, often I wish I had done this more, but um, my, my daughter has, is in a third, fourth grade multi-age class. And I was just thinking she has a learning partner. And I think how powerful is that to like establish at the beginning of the year, this is your learning partner not because you're at the same place and right. everything, which is not even a real thing, but because, I don't know, you know, like an inventory of who they are and how they can complement each other as learners. And they can give each other feedback too. So peer, you know, peer feedback was always a huge part of my practice, but having like a partner that you are deeply connected with, even if like not on a friendship level, but as, you know, like a peer to peer, could be a friendship, but peer to peer. I mean, I know that relationship for my daughter is really pretty profound. And, um, and, I, and I'm thinking back and wishing I had done more of that. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard in a class of 25 to be able to go to each individual and provide feedback. We're trying to find that time and space where you can, you know, um, whether that's your advisory or your um, whatever group that is, to give them feedback is is essential but i feel like the peer to peer piece is a way to ensure that there's the ongoing feedback and i think it'd be really interesting to even have um peers that are not at the same like you know mm -hmm. they're on different journeys on you know on a target or proficiency and like to be able to speak to each other and coach each other through it 
And even, I love that idea. Um, and even just to be like a reflective listener, you know what I mean? Like just having the role of someone um, listening um, in the reflective process um, as a peer, I think that I could imagine that would be so powerful. Um, some of the things that I would use, I definitely did um, use some small group instruction. One of the things that the shift to proficiency-based learning helped me with so much was getting really clear on what it was that I was um, designing for and assessing. And so my feedback, I feel like, actually got so much better once I knew what it was that um, we were designing towards and using it throughout the process of learning. Um, I was thinking back when you were asking, my teaching partner um, had a mechanic stool, which is like a small stool with wheels on it, and would actually roll around the classroom and it, you would be like at the height of the students. And when I think about giving feedback to kids, I just think about like getting on their level and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with students um, and not so much filling in the answers or doing the telling, but asking the questions to prompt the reflection um, to help them move forward. Um, and so those are some of the things that we definitely um, utilized a lot um, uh, in our practice. Yeah, and then self-assessment too, I think we yes. done earlier. But, you know, like I think there has to be a variety of levels of feedback, like mm -hmm. being able to assess yourself and say, where am I, you know, and, and feeling mm -hmm. okay about that. And then having peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, and then having, I love the, the wheelie chair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like I did that with like an exercise ball, like yeah, rolling, yeah. Off around rolling and like, over you know, next to somebody, you know, but um. And also backing up, like, I feel like, you know, giving young people time and space to ask each other questions. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of like with a learning partner to be able to really work on reflective listening, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, and, and teaching that, like, that's a huge skill. Um, and, and then I feel like the communication with families was really important too, about like, these are our goals for the week. Here's where I'm at. Um, this is what I could use support in. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to work on next week, you know. And so, like that constant feedback loop, you know, is can come from a variety of different spokes, you know. And um, so that when it comes time for a summative piece, there's no surprise. It's just more. It should be more like this is. This feels like I don't know about a celebration. But like, but also like a, a way to close something, you know, close this chapter, you know, and then moving on to the next, the next piece of this chapter. And I, I just love too, with you both talking about being a reflective listener and a learning partner, you know, I, I just, I feel like that's been an adjustment for a lot of, you know, veteran teachers is this, like, it's good for kids to be talking about their learning with one another. And it's, it's an okay thing to be asking each other questions and not, you know, especially during any formative times, like not to be silent, just doing like it, they definitely need time for their own thinking, but to be okay with, oh, like, I don't understand. So I'm going to ask you, or, or I'm going to learn about your strategy there. And that's, I feel like that's so powerful to, to give them those opportunities to talk about their learning versus just like, here's a task that, you know, your individual task, you need to do this by yourself so I can see what you can do alone. Like that's, yeah, there's a time and place for that with a summative. I feel like, you know, 95, 90% of the time should be that, you know, that messy learning process. And that's yeah. what I feel like the standards-based learning, proficiency-based learning provides educators, like you were saying, Lindsay, just gives you more of that freedom of playing around with some different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And it might feel a little more noisy, a little more messy, a little more like, you know, like, um, but like, that's good. Like, that's the kind of, whoa, you just went to like, <laughs> right. I wasn't there. <laughs> um, that's the kind of, I mean, like, when we think about the purpose of, you know, like, the, being in school is to be, you know, like, career and college readiness, like, those are the, like, no, there's not many jobs where you work in complete silence unless you work on your own or, like, like <laughs> a library or, I don't, even in a library, it's not silent, <laughs> I don't know, but like there, you know, like that's the creative process is working it out with somebody and asking them about how they did it so that they can, mm. you can learn from them and they can learn from you. And 
um, instead of like, again, like the teacher is not the holder of all the knowledge, like mm -hmm. it's facilitating the process. So it's back to that mindset that we started with. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have, oh, we have, should I ask a few more questions here? I think we have a couple minutes. Um, there's a couple of questions from the field, uh, especially that first one okay. that I think would be really valuable because I think that this question comes up time and time again. Um, it says, with the shift to proficiency-based learning, my students can redo and revise the process of learning, and I fear that they're losing motivation, knowing that they can just redo something. What can I do to keep my students motivated? And again, I think this comes back um, to that whole culture of compensation versus communication. I think if your culture is around the compensation of the score, then you're right. Kids are just going to be like, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want here and just I'll retake it and just get that score I want versus if your culture is around the process of the learning, mm -hmm. um, that's where, you know, you're communicating the, about their process and it, it turns into a growth versus a reward. You know, we're, we're celebrating the growth versus we're celebrating the end score, um, which I think is such an adjustment, mm -hmm. a philosophical change for a lot of uh, people that is, I think, key. And it comes back to, again, building relationships and building that culture with your class. Like, what is it, what, what are you going to value with your learners? So what are your experiences with that? Or, again, now that you're working with so many schools, I'm sure you probably hear some of this stuff more and more. Um, yeah, what do you think? I think about um, when I think about that question, also thinking about how are you getting feedback from your students about their learning? Um, so I think, um, you know, part of what we talked about was the flexibility and the creativity that's allowed in the design of instruction and on learning. And so, um, you know, I think building those relationships and building in that mindset and getting feedback and partnering with your learners, um, making sure they're clear on both the learning scale, but then also they have a voice in the learning process. You know, I think all of those things help build that intrinsic motivation. And I think it does come back to those relationships and the culture, um, the culture in the classroom. Um, and that big change from compensation, I think. Um, yeah, I was just thinking like, if you can communicate that you are proficient on in the first time, why are you gonna, why would you even like waste your time to, um, to, um, <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I got another guest on the show. Meet Rosie. She's a very <laughs> proficient dog. Um, uh, why would you, why would you like, you'd want to go on to the next thing. You'd have that 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 investment mm -hmm. in your learning and that desire to want to engage right but if it just is like all right well I can get compensated this for another day you know so I'll just go back and redo it you know and I think the redo can become really um can become um problematic when it's like oh I'm just gonna go back and you know like do this thing real quick and now I got my three you know and it's like so again it's that it's that I, it's like what are you redoing like what's a redo like it's not a redo it's like a demonstration that you have mastered something like or that you you got it you know so like I think this idea of redo I would take out that word and and like um you know put put something else in there I don't know what the word is but it's like the redo has become like this quick fix. It's like the way that our society is. It's like, I can just, you know, search it. And then I, you know, it's like, slow down, you know, let's go back to this. Maybe this is not the best way to demonstrate your learning on this particular proficiency or what might it look like having that conversation and that dialogue with a student around like, what might this look like if you were to, if you wanted to, to truly demonstrate a three in this area mm -hmm. like redoing something seems uh I'm now I'm like really questioning that like why would you redo something in the formative process right like wouldn't you just file that away so that you like and know that your next goal or your next move is going to be whatever 
Is there a redo and a summative? I I don't know. I'm asking that, you. That's what I, when I read this, I wasn't even thinking formative. I was thinking summative because I feel like that's when this comes oh. up again and again. Because with, with me, like there's no re reason to redo in a formative practice because that's just, you know, right. we're learning, you're just practicing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just giving you feedback about where you're at at the time. But with the summative, you know, I feel like this definitely comes up with the conversation around, all right, are we letting kids redo or retake mm -hmm. this test? And it's like, absolutely. Why wouldn't you want to give them an opportunity to show that they're making growth toward mastery on this right. content, which from a teacher's standpoint, it takes extra time because it's not just uh, you missed it here, try it again. That might take a week of reteaching something. Yes. And, and a lot of times like with us, you know, like when I'm teaching math, if, if a kid misses something, we have this whole um, kind of like correction process uh, where they're doing like they're looking at the mistakes that they're making they're learning from their mistakes they're doing some practice to, to practice with the content that they they might have missed or the concepts that they missed and that's all required before they can even retake yes and yes. it's like yeah it's that makes a work. lot of sense yeah it's a significant work but it's like I'm, i don't just give them a new test with new questions and say all right we'll try again it's like no like what's i think that's where a lot of the misconception is coming in with, with this process is all right yeah. if i'm gonna let a kid keep taking this over and over again like why would why would they be motivated well if you're making them do some serious learning in between the the yeah, research, right. they're right. going to be motivated because that's that's a lot of work and that's that's kind <laughs> of so you know that's that's a big piece i know like when i heard from uh rick wormley has, has a great segment on this and what retakes are all about yeah. so that would be another resource if yeah, anybody's a good one. More of that. nice um, can we maybe, I know we have two, like two minutes here, but that last one there, there's a couple of questions that are really good. Like one is about like proficient, like how many proficiencies are too many. And like, I think that can be really problematic too, around like having too many. So I'm curious, like maybe we go there right now. Like that could be a quick little whip around. Like what was the standard unit, um, for you guys when you ha were teaching, uh, in the classroom, like what would be a standard amount of standards or proficiencies that you would address? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Like there would be the transferable skills, whatever they're called in our various districts, yeah. right? You know, and so those are always kind of like the threads of everything, right? You know, and maybe you're highlighting, like really targeting a couple of those in this, in a particular, I don't know. But I feel like it'd be like two or three, you know, that you're looking at, you know, whether it's something around, communication, reading, writing, speaking, mm -hmm. listening. And then like the content specific, you know, like can whatever I can, I, I don't know. Um, so I think it has to be, I think fewer is way richer. You can design a unit that both provides you and your students with a creative way to demonstrate your learning. And you can go way deeper into your learning too instead of trying to like check off a whole lot of different proficiencies. I mean, the, the transferable skills are like the fabric of all learning, you know, right? So you would imagine you're hitting on them all, you know, all the time in a variety of ways. But like, I feel like with the content area piece, it's like two or three, you know, in a unit. I don't know, maybe, what do you think? I think it's, you know, it depended on the grain size, you know, yeah. that we were right. talking about. But I always sort of thought about it as a sandwich, and I'm not sure why that's what sort of stuck with me, but I had sort of like my, because I taught humanities, I had my literacy, so I had my reading, I had some form of writing, then I had my um, global citizenship, and then, you know, the bottom was my transferable skills or scholarly habits, and so the trick really was about which ones coupled and amplified each other really well. And then it didn't feel like so many. Totally. And so I think the, um, the number comes up like, how many should I be doing? There's, too, there's too many. And, and yes, too many is, is definitely problematic, but it's really looking at it and saying which ones amplify and connect with each other enough that when you then layer on the content, it's, it's cohesive. Um, but I think, you know, like three, probably three or four, um, a unit would be yeah. about where, where we were knowing that some I would be addressing, but maybe not assessing necessarily because I knew I was coming back to it. Exactly. I was thinking about assessing. Yeah. 
yeah. but yeah, and because uh, there's the the whole different piece between yeah. assessing and assessing too, right? Yeah. But like a, a few that you'd be assessing. Yeah. That was a big conversation we've been having in our district um, because I, I was just looking at our humanities learning skills, our targets. Um, we have seven for the district, that, like for seventh and eighth grade, for instance. And it's because the way we wrote our scales, it's we, everything's integrated in one. So we don't just have like uh, transferable skills separate from content. It's just we don't really have content standards anymore. It's more skills based. So like, for example, our evidence target is I can use credible piece of evidence to support my claim. That would be the three, that, that's proficient. Totally. The, the two is I can use evidence that connects to my claim. One is I can use evidence that relates to my topic. So it's like, mm -hmm. you can see that progression, the building there, and then you figure out what content's going to fit in with that. Yes, You're like, yes. right, I want to address you know, this specific literature book. I'm going to use that content to help support what skill we're working on. Um, and I think that's really helped. I mean, that's seven for a whole year. You do one or two per unit, then you can really come back and let them repract, you know, keep practicing and, and address them again and again throughout the school year, which I've found has been really helpful for us because we're not worried about getting through 25 content standards anymore. It's exactly. Now, we have these seven just learning targets that we're going to address by the end of the school year. That's been, that's been very helpful. That sounds like a great system. So, so we're at 4.30 here. Yeah. yeah, we're wrapping up. All right. Um, so an amazing conversation as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank uh, you. I know we have, we have some, some resources, events, and, and happenings coming up. So before I, I read what uh, Don has shared on this document, Maura, that you put together, um, do you have anything that you would both like to highlight out of this? Uh, the middle grades conference is coming up on January 11th at UVM. It's a free conference. I think the registration needs to happen by like now. And, um, and it's a great way to just see what's happening throughout the educational landscape and in, in regards to all sorts of personalization, proficiency-based learning, student-centered learning. So the, I would put that out there. And then the Vamly Conference is in March, the Beyond Bullying Conference. And that is on a date that probably not, oh, here it is, March 11th. And that's at Champlain College. And that's for youth and adult teams to come together. Most of the workshops are either facilitated by youth or co-facilitated by youth. And it's a great day to think about how do we create more positive, inclusive communities in our schools? Um, the VPA um, just posted there's going to be a proficiency-based learning symposium, oh. continuous growth together on February 11th um, for really schools around the state to come together and sort of share what's, um, what's going on, ideas, opportunities, best practices, celebrations, what are some common challenges. Um, and so that um, is coming up. So if you want to learn more or hear from different voices, um, that will be an opportunity to continue this conversation. Great. Awesome. Well, that's good for me. Well, thank you again, both of you. Um, and for everybody listening, I hope you all have a peaceful and restful holiday break. And we'll be tuning in in 2020. Yeah. All right. All right. Everybody have a great Bye, night. Bye. Bye.